Hello, hello. I'm Osman with House Einstein, and with me is Hamish Crab. Welcome to House Einstein podcast number 21. And if this is your first time joining us, I am a real estate agent here in Boulder, Colorado, and I'm the founder of the House Einstein brokerage. Previously, the founder of another brokerage that still exists here in Boulder. Also previously with uh, Remax and a boutique brokerage on Nantucket. Prior to that, and now we're past 20 years, I worked in the investment community and um, continue to dabble as an investor and advising investors here in Boulder. But primarily, our clients are residential buyers and sellers who care about the investment side, the due diligence side, and the negotiation side of primarily residential real estate, not just here in Boulder, but Denver, the mountains, and our footprint continues to expand. We are a small boutique brokerage here in Boulder. The front range and beyond. The front range and beyond. Our voices go much farther or much further. Um, and Hamish, his, he's been with us now for a period of time and his primary role, what did you call yourself uh, in our team I, meeting yesterday? I just, I help run a real estate brokerage. <laughs> you do. You really yeah. actually help run a real estate brokerage and jack of all trades, which has been fantastic. But one of the primary skill sets that you bring to the table that's very distinct is your capability and passion in videography and marketing, photography as well, and storytelling, and, and your skill set there is phenomenal. And we're very Thank grateful you. for it in our brokerage. Much appreciated. Um, um, let's yeah. touch on the topics, and then I'll do my usual disclaimer. Okay. Cool. So we're going to be a little fast on this podcast because we need to end uh, within 45 minutes of this time. And uh, so it'll be a quicker podcast than normal, but we are going to cover some topics that should be of interest to you. Today, we're going to talk about trust, the secret ingredient to not just real estate transactions, but all high-end transactions and high-end negotiations. We're going to talk about what we've been learning in video marketing and marketing in general, what we're doing this week. Um, we're going to talk about some of the lessons learned from losing a listing and then the last topic is our regular approach to benchmarking our listings against their competition, how we look at the competitive landscape and how we communicate that with our clients, how we adjust our marketing uh, relative to the competition, because listings don't just fly off the market. Uh, sometimes we don't have bidding wars. Sometimes it does take a long time to sell a home, especially in an era of extremely high interest rates. Uh, where buyers are pickier or more selective, I should say, than ever. <laughs> yeah. And um, let's see, on the note of videography and marketing, um, you could call that entertainment, much like this podcast, right, Oz? That's right. Thank you for the, the tee up for the disclaimer. Yeah, gotcha. So per the attorneys that advise us, this podcast is not real estate advice. It is entertainment. And if you are a client of House Einstein, please contact your House Einstein agent directly for real estate advice relative to your specific situation. If you are my client, you have my cell phone number. You might even know where I live and knock on the door. And that happens too. And that's okay. Pretty rare, but it does occasionally happen. Uh, but call me if you want to talk about your real estate situation. And that's what I'm here for. And if you're a client of another real estate agent in our company, please reach out to them. And if you're not a client, this is definitely time to think about becoming one or uh, contact your agent for their advice. But this podcast is real estate entertainment. And thank you for watching and listening to it. We appreciate your comments, your feedback, and some new clients that have come to us from this podcast. Absolutely. So we uh, typically plan kind of the agenda of each podcast, and we did that today. Um, and in just hearing you now, Osman, for this intro, I think it actually makes sense to come from the lessons learned and then wrap that into trust. Um, because the kind of takeaway on the lesson learned of the listing is you were full disclosure and had that trust. And that's also part of kind of how it wraps in. Well, I guess that there's that that is a good point. So we'll start with that one. Lessons learned from a lost listing. And it's a... Um, a potential seller who is potentially a podcast listener too. Uh, I'm not sure if they are or not, but they had chosen me uh, and things were going swimmingly in the listing presentation 
until the moment I told them that I'm actually leaving town for a few weeks coming up, which will occur during their listing period. And I will be available. I'll be working, but my time will be working flipped. So I'll be available in the mornings and the evenings, phone call and emails. It's a working trip, but I won't be able to visit them on the ground. And if anything does come up on the ground, I've got a fantastic team who I will be partnering with. Uh, Ian and Sophie are both here. And should there be a need for an agent, plus you, you're actually licensed as well, Hamish. We've got a killer team, the best in the business. And we work so closely together. And I could feel the energy drop when I told them I'm leaving town. And um, they said they would think about it. And the next day they called me and said they've chosen someone else. And I called them back and I asked why, uh, because I want to learn what did we do wrong and how can we improve? And she basically said, we would have chosen you except the fact that you're leaving town. And that makes us nervous. And I don't blame them. They don't know Ian. They don't know you, Hamish. They don't know Sophie. They don't know how well we work together as a team. And so when you're selling your potentially multi-million dollar property here in Boulder, you don't want to hear that you're your agent's leaving town. So the lesson learned is actually I should have brought Ian or Sophie with me or you even, but probably Ian or Sophie since they I couldn't tend to make take it the lead. if I recall. Yeah, that's right. You couldn't make it. Um, I mm-hmm. should have called either of them to accompany me, especially given their listing is occurring. Um, it will likely go live while I'm on this trip. So um, I'm okay with not having the listing, although I feel very sad because this particular listing is just going to be such a stunner from a videography perspective. And there should be such a demand for this listing that it probably will go under contract right away. It probably will not be a long listing. And it would have been such a great listing to highlight all of the features uh, of the surrounding landscape. It's such a cool property. Uh, with that said, this, there's not it's not all negative um, versus lessons that we learned. And I'm glad I was honest with them. We don't, I don't, I have a hard time. I don't lie. Like my face is, I'm so uncomfortable with lying um, that if I have to bend the truth for negotiation purposes, it's much better if I do that uh, in an email or a text message because I just, I'm just not, I don't, it's not in my nature to lie. Um, So I will, of course, negotiate aggressively and for my clients. But if I suddenly switch to emails and texts, it's because there's something up uh, (laughs) because I don't like having to take positions that are bendy of the truth. Um, but with that said, I, I don't feel bad about telling them the truth. That, that is the truth. The regret is just I should have brought Ian or Sophie team members so they could meet them in person and we could have that discussion. Because once the listing is live, almost all of it that we do is remote. Phone mm-hmm. calls and emails and contracts, none of it requires an in-person visit. Um, once we're live, in-person visits are extremely rare for me as an agent. Um, if something were to come up, say, on inspection and they want my eyes on it, that would be a potential. But it's so it's like one in 10, but maybe then one the in systems 20. systems and our videography and everything, like I could be there boots on the ground and get it to you within like an hour, you know. Easily. Um, Easily. Yeah. The I, I We had like a little debrief after, um, you know, they let us know that they're choosing someone else. And. I remember you were going down this kind of like different paths of like, well, you know, could I have not brought up that I was leaving? And we settled on like, absolutely no, because that's kind of what makes us us is like the trust and our openness. It's like it would have felt dishonest to not disclose to the client that you were leaving town. You know, like our lesson learned was we should have incorporated the team, but it wasn't that, oh, we should have lied. So we got the listing next time. Right. You know. Well, I guess part of it is because I've been so trained for fa- fast response. Mm. Um, if people are not getting a response within an hour or two, that's unusual. And yeah. often I'm so glued to my phone that people get f- responses even within 15 minutes. Even years after they were actively a client, they get a response within 15 minutes. And that's not necessarily a healthy way to be, but that's the real estate business. We have to be responsive. We have to work nights and weekends, and that's why I have a team so I can actually have a life and travel. Well, it's not the only reason. It's fun to play in the real estate world with a team, but one of the reasons I have a team is so that we can maintain coverage when I have to go to a wedding or a funeral or there's a family event or I want to go on vacation. Um, So all of those things are very important and actually good questions to ask when you're interviewing agents is how do you manage this business? Because it is a nights and weekends and intense, intense business and people with children 
um, often struggle to have that level of responsiveness. And maybe it's not necessary for this particular trip. My plan is not to be working in the middle of the night because I'm on the other side of the world. My plan is to be working in the morning and in the evening, which will just be flipped time zones. So there'll be more like four to six hours before you get a response, maybe a little longer in the middle of the day. But you should be monitoring, Hamish, my email and phone calls too. Mm -hmm. So you may still get 15-minute responses. Exactly. A response from Osman might take longer, but a response from Hal Seinstein would still be within the realm. And 90% of the time, you know the answer because you're part mm-hmm. of every single transaction for four, for three agents constantly. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's sort of unfortunate that we lost them. But I, and I, but I don't feel like – I don't feel massive regret because things happen for a reason. And we have a competitive listing actually that potentially could be going live in Mountain Meadows. And that listing um, – I'd rather not have listings that are priced so close anyway. Um, mm. And uh, it happens, right? You see people in neighborhoods um, dominate the neighborhood. And that's useful because they really can know the distinctions. Like we saw two listings in um, Lafayette yesterday and Wanaka Lake, same agent, and they're priced differently. They're priced about 100000 apart. One's a ranch with a, with a full basement that both uh, – it's two bedrooms up, two bedrooms down, r- nice finishes, unassuming on the outside – cul-de-sac location. The other one is on a busier street, classic two-story, poor quality finishes. Um, and they're a hundred thousand apart. And he, uh, in knowing that neighborhood is setting the market, right? Cause he has advised mm. these people, individual sellers to set certain price points, um, because it makes sense. And you would be shocked how often agents do not understand the competitive landscape when they price listings. We have a listing right now up on Sugarloaf. And it's now um, becoming seasoned. It's been on the market a little while. And what we do with our listings is we regularly review the competition. This is the competitive landscape topic. And um, so if it has not gone under contract within the first two weeks, what's happening is we're looking at new listings hitting the market and we're looking at the old listings continually and we're soliciting feedback directly with phone calls and emails of the agents that showed the property to understand how is this home positioned relative to its competition. And there have right now there there are 15 listings that you could conceivably say are competitors on a price point basis, of which a few have sold in the last two months and a few have gone under contract. And guess how many agents of those competitors actually scheduled a showing to come look at this listing at any point since it began? One. One of the competitive agents has scheduled a showing on our property. The rest are going blind. Yeah. And so there is an advantage to an agent like this one in Lafayette that actually dominates a neighborhood because they know the neighborhood much better than agents that don't. But it's very common for agents to play this game where they say they know the competition, but they haven't even scheduled a showing on it. Mm -hmm. How can they know that competitors? And we have frequently in the run up to pricing right before we go live made a fifty dollars to $100,000 price adjustment on what we recommend to list at, the initial listing pr- list price. And usually it's to the upside because we've seen the competitor and we're like, oh, we missed this because you wouldn't see this from looking on the MLS. You wouldn't understand the parking limitations or the weird lot or the odd smell or the things like the cheaply finished kitchen we saw in Arapahoe Ridge a year ago when mm-hmm. we listed a home or eight months ago when we told our clients go 50000 higher. That kitchen is garbage. It yeah. looked good in the photos, but when you actually come and look at it, it's like it's lipstick on a pig. It's I don't know. Pick your analogy. It's horrible. It just looks good in the photos, and the wide yeah. angle lenses were very were very tricky. It didn't show how tight the flow is and how poor the design is. You can easily go higher. And originally we were going to go lower. And it um, is more important, especially when you're talking mountain properties, because mountain properties are so unique to each other. So the fact right. that you have so few agents actually doing the uh, boots on the ground kind of investigation is insane. Um, there's just so many unique characteristics and uh, almost data points of each property that you have to take into consideration on your valuation. Right. There's additional data points. Acreage, yeah. um, fire resistance, uh, winter access, flatness of the lot. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, there's so many other factors that go into pricing mountain properties that it is... I would say, so in a normal listing in town, in the home in a subdivision, it's sort of 
maybe 70% um, quantitative analysis and 30% qualitative. But for the mountains, it's more like 50, 50. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot more data points and then there's qualitative um, evaluation of those data points. Right. And that takes on the ground investigation more so than not. You, um, you have yeah. to physically go see the competitors. So when, once the listing's underway and it's been priced and it's been on the market for a while, the next step is to, to frequently, at least twice a month, go look at the competitive landscape. See what's sold, see what's under contract, see what new listings have arisen. Discuss with um, agents that have sold property what negotiations were like, how many showings did they get for new listings, that will all help inform your client on whether they should consider a price improvement or not. And it'll also help um, the agent, us, decide is, is our marketing approach working? Like, do we need to revisit some aspect of this? The staging, the photography, the videography. Does the feedback say there's a weird smell? Um, should we have the windows cleaned again? Uh, all of those factors. Um, and and sh what are people missing? Like, why are they not seeing why this listing is compelling compared to the competition? And the truth might be that the listing is not compelling at all. Mm -hmm. Like, there's some pretty dumpy houses on the market in general. And if the seller's not willing to fix the, the stained carpet and the cat pee smell, there's only one thing you can do, right? If every, yeah. all the marketing is correct and the seller's not willing to address the issue, um, then the answer is cut the price. Uh, but, but that's usually the last thing we want our sellers to do because we hopefully priced it right to begin with. Well, it's yeah. not hope. We bust our tail to price <laughs> it right to begin with. And yeah, it's getting the correct pricing and hitting the market while the iron is hot, so to speak, is um, a really interesting kind of practice because you're not so much going for what is right then in the moment, but you're thinking a little bit movement ahead um, to try and catch the market as it moves, not as it is in that snapshot. You see a lot of stale listings where they still have the the pricing as though it's 2022, and it just yeah, isn't the case that's true. anymore. Yeah. Um, I I just realized my phone was on, and Tisk. we might have a Bluetooth issue. I just tried to power it off, but I think I chose restart instead, so <laughs> it might suddenly grab the Bluetooth out of this. So if we suddenly have an audio problem, we may have to pause. Um, so, what does that dovetail to? Well, we've talked about. The competitive landscape approach we've talked about some of the lessons learned from losing a listing um but we have not talked about video marketing so let's let's move to marketing and this week in marketing are you ready mm -hmm. so uh, there's a couple of things happening this week one we're so active that creating time for uh reels or instagram stories or uh, youtube shorts intentionally takes us out of our business practice because we've got clients to serve, buyers and sellers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I spent 45 minutes, actually spent over an hour looking at a listing this week in North Boulder and produced a 45 minute long video using a mirrorless camera and a gimbal. Um, a 30 I don't gig. Know how, 30 gig video <laughs> plus aerials yeah. looking for what's right and more importantly, what's wrong with a listing for our remote buyers to consider. And if I'm spending all that time doing the video and you're editing the video and getting it online, what we're not doing is making cutesy video stories for Instagram. And we're not, uh, we're not, we're not soliciting new business in our marketing. We're taking care of our, our existing business, our buyers and sellers who always come first. So the reason I'm sharing that is that the new approach that we're playing with this week is trying to remember when we're on the fly doing things uh, to take short videos, vertical yeah. videos. And what are we, what are we doing Snippets, right now? Snaps. What's yeah. happening right now in the life of real estate agents on the team and you Hamish as well. What are we up to in yeah. a fun and playful way? And so, uh, three times yesterday, I pulled out my camera, I held it out in front of me and I said, okay, this is what I'm doing right now. Or this is what Perfect. I just did. Um, and I'm going to upload those to you, uh, Hamish to play with and see if there's a story that we can craft as a team because the rest of the team's doing this as well, just for play. But it's it's stuff that's happening in between the business. And the upside, and you know, it's play with great upside and very little downside. So it's kind of it's you know a no brainer to to play around with it. It's a no brainer to play around with it yeah. as long as it's in the spirit of play and fun. 
because let's face it, it, it's it, for new agents that have started to get into video marketing, being in front of the camera is challenging. Um, it is, it is very intimidating. And what's, what I've found having now worked with seven or eight agents, uh, with video is some mm -hmm. agents think they are really good when they're not. Uh, <laughs> some agents say it's so easy and they're, it's not easy at all. It's challenging in a good way. Um, and it's hard to be authentic and, and it's, it's hard to remember to look at the camera. The talent side of real estate is not a, prior to five years ago was not relevant. Mm -hmm. um, could you look good in front of camera? Now it's really relevant. And what we're seeing is a, a, is a rapid evolution. So now m many of our competitors have started to do what we were doing three years ago, which is three axis gimbal movement in the video. Uh, every video has drone shots. We're, we're, they're also starting to do narrative mm -hmm. um, and, and narrate the video. And we're seeing some of them. I mean, I'm happy to see them catching up in some ways, but we're already like two years past with what they're doing. And they're uncomfortable in front of camera. It's obvious they're uncomfortable in front of camera. Yeah. Um, and they didn't script it because they probably went in with like an egoic, hey, I just know what I'm going to say approach. And they sound sort of... <laughs> What, what was the word, Hamish, that you used earlier? Oh, it's it's gone now. It's not script. Yeah, they don't sound scripted, but pretentious, maybe? I, they just sound like they're saying things off the cuff. And, yeah. you know, I really want to believe people. So I initially give people the benefit of the doubt. But then when they listen to what they said the second time, I'm like, mm, what you're saying actually is sort of ridiculous. <laughs> the the crux of my issue with the way people are on camera and especially when they're riffing and it's not scripted or they don't put a whole bunch of thought into what they're saying is here they are sitting in front of a multi-million dollar home opining on the you know what they love about it and what they the design is so fantastic and in doing so they're using this huge vocabulary and they're trying to make themselves sound so much more but because they haven't scripted it or refined what they're saying it kind of you, you read between the lines and it's like, oh, you look worse because you haven't put together the verbiage and the vocabulary that accents what you're trying to communicate on this home. So you're, I, that, that's a very roundabout way to say what I'm saying. Did that make sense? No, it totally makes <laughs> okay. sense. Look, yeah. one, of the, one of the reasons we ask every one of our sellers to give us a list of what you love about this home is because first they've lived in the home. It, it, these are the selling points for them mm -hmm. uh, when they bought the home. And we, we don't know those things. I mean, we can see with independent eyes, but they may have things to point out that are very useful to highlight and distinguish this property compared to its competition. And then our goal is to say those things in an eloquent and concise manner. And as you know, each and every video we do, I am very critical about my own performance. And it's not because I'm mean on myself. It's because I want to get better for my clients. Yeah. And it's been a long time since acting was something I thought actively about. And it, it, since college, when I was involved with, you know, Broadway, well, not bro with musicals, college musicals, okay, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> uh, like anything goes and um, uh, that sort of thing I was doing in college where acting was suddenly a skill set. I haven't thought about that in decades. And in video, video land, if you're going to narrate, you really need to be talent, not just read what you're writing. I'm not... We don't all need to be, uh, what's his name? Oh, the actor that played Bruce Almighty and. Oh, I don't know. Uh, oh, Jim Carrey? No. No, Jim Carrey's not. No, no. Yeah. But there's voice talent that really kills it. Okay. And you know who they are when you hear their voice. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to be that person, but there are simple things we can do to improve how we're speaking. I mean, I've done years of Toastmasters. That was very helpful for public speaking live, but not particularly useful for critical feedback for oneself in video. But how they say it is is one thing. The other thing Huge. is what they're saying sometimes sounds, yeah. frankly, ridiculous. And, and then the third piece, which is even more important, okay, because let's face it, a buyer that's looking at the video is not going to fixate on the words yeah. as specifically uh, as the quality and of the video itself. What they're not doing 
So they're spending thousands oh, of dollars yeah, on going. these videos, which is mm -hmm. probably what they're going to cost, right? A couple thousand bucks, but then they're failing yeah. to pay for distribution. And I don't know what's wrong with them <laughs> or why. Maybe they don't care because they think the video is just for the seller to ooh and ah over. And the answer to that is no, the video is for potential mm -hmm. buyers to ooh and ah over. It's to help convince people that weren't necessarily looking for this product to go look at this house. They hadn't thought about it before, but you know, it actually looks kind of cool. And even though it doesn't fit every functional requirement, or maybe it's a little bit over budget for where we were going to go, let's just go look at it, honey. <laughs> and what happens if the house is really all that, you, you, we've done our job by increasing the number mm -hmm. of people to come look at the home. Our job is to massively increase the funnel as much as possible. And when they enter the home, we've got a lot of advice for the seller to how to improve how a home presents itself. But then at that point, we usually within the first 60 seconds, buyers have made a decision on whether they're going to write an offer or not. And then they go to rationality after they've already made the emotional decision. Mm -hmm. That's how the human brain works. That's what's happening. And so our job is to just increase that funnel as much as possible and push more people to go see the house. So when you see some of our listings, Hamish, and your marketing efforts, we're getting tens of thousands of views yeah, in the course on YouTube of less alone. than 30 days. Like, but, and it's yeah. on just YouTube, you were getting tens of thousands of views if you pay f the platform, because guess what? The platform is there to make money. They're not a, they're not a public square it's not altruism. You tap up your notice and you just, <laughs> yeah. it's not altruism, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube, even TikTok. Although I'm, I'm sort of yeah. negative on TikTok because of the, the, the CCP involvement <laughs> in TikTok, but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, we pay to drive traffic because that's how we increase the footprint. So in addition to professional photography and sticking it on the magic listing system, we are also doing high end videography and we are paying to drive traffic to that video on multiple platforms. And it is just astounding to me how few agents will pay for distribution. And if you're wondering, go look at their YouTube and their listing videos and look at the yeah. view count. And if the view count is astoundingly low for a very high end video, that video was not produced for buyers. It was produced yeah, to impress the seller. To kind of, I don't necessarily know if we're done with this topic, but in a little bit of a recap, you talked about the quality of the video and then the quality of the content. And that's massive. You, you could have fantastic content. You know, the agent's lines are perfect. And not only that, but they're hitting notes that, um, a buyer wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be apparent no matter how good the video is. Um, you have this beautiful wrapper that gets the buyers to watch, but then if the content isn't good, the buyer is still going to bounce. So you, a uh, big thing is like, I saw the most recent video we watched, uh, this agent talked about the design. Well, we know the design it's in the video. It looks great. How does it feel to be in the house? You know, what, what, how does the, you know, are you, do you feel like it's in an open area? Are you cozy? Like, what are senses that cannot be communicated through video that have been captured fantastic, you know, that you can describe properly? It's You've got to bring more to the table than just be like, I'm in this gorgeous house. It's gorgeous because you can see it and it's on the video. Thank you. Let's go. You know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that resonates a lot for me, Hamish. And as you know, we typically put listings mm -hmm. into two categories. And if the listing is uh, what I call a sexy house, then yeah. my intro says less. I'm there to get out of the way of your video. If the, vi the house itself is not a sexy house, so we listed a home a few years ago in Baseline um, that was a student rental full of student rental stuff. You know, the kind of things that college students put on the walls, posters, their beer can collection. Like it just looks like a college rental inside mm -hmm. and all the finishes are worn. That's not a house I'm going to ask you to do it's, high it's end. It's not about the appeal there, yeah. videography on yeah, <laughs> the landlord finishes, yeah. the landlord fixtures, the landlord appliances that have been bought whole, you know, at the cheapest price are not compelling video. But what is compelling about that home? It was the location, the proximity to see you, the reasonable price, the some of the improvements they made, the park right down the street. So we focused on those elements. We did show a few movement shots in the home, but the narration, yeah. we call those smart buy videos um, instead of the sexy videos. Uh, sometimes we get something in between, mostly mm -hmm. it's one or the other. And uh, we are trying to help educate a client, a buyer on why this home 
is worth buying compared to the competition. So a couple of things to watch if you're choosing listing agents. One is uh, the quality of their content and also the distribution of their content. And does it actually add value to the transaction? Does it add value to the potential buyer pool? Like, are you increasing the number of buyers or not? And um, be very cognizant of content that's created for sellers just to feel impressed. Similar to that, uh, and I've shared this story before, the brokerage on Nantucket I originally worked for, spent thousands of dollars on marketing every month with the local newspaper. And in my experience in working with this brokerage for three years, we sold zero houses from somebody mm -hmm. who saw it in the newspaper. The, the newspaper advertising and the slick, glossy magazine that was a lifestyle magazine that we were advertising. And you see that here in Boulder, too. There's a Boulder lifestyle ad or mag that they send to everyone in town. And there's lots of agents to spend thousands of dollars to put their face in that magazine. That is not for your listing. Mm -hmm. That is to get listings. It makes sellers feel good that maybe their agent's doing something besides sticking it on the magic listing nice. service, but it doesn't actually add value. In my opinion, after 20 years, I'm going to say the same thing I would have said in year three. This is marketing for attracting more sellers and to make the sellers feel good like their agent's doing something, but it doesn't actually increase the number of potential right. buyers getting into the funnel. And the only way to know that is look at the view counts. Um, and you, you as a consumer cannot see the necessarily the Facebook and social media footprint, but you can currently yeah. see the YouTube footprint. Uh, and it's very easy to go look at their, look at their YouTube link. And, the, and this particular agent has a gorgeous listings and, and I like so. her as a colleague, but, and I'm not saying her name cause this is a criticism of my category, but if you look at the view counts on her YouTube, it's like 200, fewer than 200. One has fewer than 200. One I think has fewer than 100. And the listing has been on the market two weeks. And, at this point, we would have like 15,000 credit words, dude, they're video. good videos. They're great houses. And her comments and narration in the houses, there's nothing wrong with. This is more or less constructive and, and constructive for ourselves too, you know? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. We're learning and we're, we, by critiquing our colleagues, we're learning and we're mm. always seeking to improve what we're doing. Um, and, and I would say the order of operations for quality is Huge. sound and then videography, and, and, uh, and then narration. And the three pieces of those help form a story. Um, and then the last piece is, okay, well, now that you've got high quality video mastered and with story, now what, how's the distribution? Because no one's going to read or, or see the story or listen to the story mm -hmm. if you're not paying the platform. You have to feed the machine. Uh, easy um, example, you know, if... A any famous piece of artwork wouldn't be worth what it is and be as revered if it was just in somebody's basement and nobody ever heard of it. You know, you could have the best thing in the world, but if it doesn't get out there, then it's that it's not the best thing in the world because it isn't, you know, kind of subject to everybody's eyes. Right. Yeah. No one knew. Right. Well, there's a reason that um, when they put high end art on auction at Christie's, it sells for millions of dollars because it's now at Christie's and there have been many notable cases of people walking into a thrift store, looking on the wall and seeing this $4 piece of art and saying, mm -hmm. that looks amazing. I'm going to buy that. And then two years later, realizing what they have and selling it for Jeez. hundreds, if not millions in an art auction because yeah. it got in front of the right people. And in the real estate world, all brokerages are members of the MLS and most brokers will do high-end photography. Well, actually, I would say most brokers will do photography and put it on the MLS. And a smaller portion of those brokers will do professional photography and put it on the MLS. Um, some will then up the ante into videography and put the link on the MLS. And then very few agents are doing what we're doing, which is in addition to all of the above, we're constantly working on improving our videography, storytelling, and uh, content. And we're also constantly looking for ways to increase distribution that makes sense. Like if we have a video that's not high quality, we're not going to spend tons of money to drive traffic mm -hmm. to it because it's not a great video. But if there is a great video, we're going to spend the money because we want views. We want eyes on this video. Um, and that's not that's exclu that's outside of listings. Listings we, we spend a lot on every video yeah. <laughs> uh, to drive traffic to, to it. And 
I feel like that's the least that we can do. We should be doing. We're we're always looking for how we can yeah. do more. I have seen. I, I have YouTube Premium, so I don't get a lot of ads on there. Um, but I did see for the first time, I think, in months, an, another agent advertising a listing on there. So it was kind of nice to see. And I think you know, end game, we're going to reach a marketing critical mass for real estate, and that's where. And you've been hitting me on this note since I've been here. Is it really is once we have the wrapping the presentation, the content is what's going to differentiate you from uh, the, the wrapping, your your videography and your visual prettiness. It's really like, what are you saying? So, yeah. mm-hmm. Well, everyone's catching up. They've been catching up for 30 years uh, mm-hmm. since I first got in this game 23 years ago. And agents weren't even using their own phone. Fo- they were just, the yeah. photos were horrific. <laughs> Um, and then agents could distinguish in themselves with better quality photography. And, and then agents started moving into video and the quality of video continues to improve. And the stuff we were doing three years ago with our videographers, I'm now seeing more commonly being used. The three axis movement, the mirrorless cameras, the drone shots, the dusk shots, that's getting better. Um, so competition will continue to improve and we will, I'm grateful mm-hmm. for it. It makes us better. Um, I still feel like we're two to three years ahead of the vast majority of agents. And the only other people that are doing what we're doing um, are at the very high end of the market in Denver and in Boulder and across the country. Like the top 1% is the quality um, that we're benchmarking. And we do that for every It's an amazing no the ability to have. Um, and also, I'm so stoked to be a part of it because it's, it's such a kind of rewarding process making a video. And um, slowly but surely, the rest of the team's getting there as well. And um, no, it's just, it's awesome because the system is huge. So it just goes so much further. Yeah. It's moving in one direction. We're not going to see less video going forward. We're going to see more. And we were going to, you have to ask yourself, is, is this compelling or is it not? Um, what made you watch this video and what didn't? And I can't compete on pretty. I'm not a 20 something attractive person that just looks pretty and people will watch mm. for the pretty agent. That's not me. Um, I'm going to do add value to the marketing side of the house. I'm going to talk about why it's a smart buy. We're going to continue to look for ways that we reach highly intelligent buyers and sellers. Um, but I, I'm never going to be able to compete on attractive um, young person. Yeah. Uh, in this and that outfit, might work for a hook, but work. it still doesn't have that uh, content that makes it uh, super compelling, right? Like you're going to maybe a pretty face will get you to watch the video, but if it's still boring, it's still boring. Well, let's say in the absence of any other information, all agents are the same and you're selling your million dollar house or buying a million dollar house. There's, you know, I, humans are humans. They're going to want to yeah. work with somebody they feel attracted to. That's just human nature. There's nothing that, there's nothing to change. It just is what it is. I, I don't bemoan this. <laughs> yeah, <pretty privileged. laughs> it is what it is. Um, so yeah. pretty privileged. Uh, and yeah, pretty privileged. Okay. So let's talk about the last Doing piece because we're almost out of time. And that is trust, the secret ingredient of real estate transactions. And I have blog posts written about this. You can find them at HowSeinstein.com. And uh, in real time, sometimes we deal with the, both the presence and absence of trust between parties in the real estate transaction. And those that behave in ways that engender trust usually have much smoother transactions with higher dollar closing values. Those that behave in ways that erode or damage trust make every aspect of the real estate process more difficult and end up costing their clients money uh, or other aspects, relationships. Uh, so I'll give you an example. We, uh, The home I'm in has some complicated systems in its solar PV um, and, uh, and, and other things with this mountain home. And we behaved very professionally and smoothly, but still aggressively initially on trying to get the deal done but capitulated quickly because there's no home like it or wasn't on the market at the time. Amateur so hour. Ringing, which is what I was afraid of. <laughs> I turned it off. Now I've heard this in uh, Tim Ferriss' <laughs> podcast, phones go yeah. off and people are like, oops. Um, so uh, I, I've called the seller multiple times years later to ask, well, can you kind of tell me who service this PV system? Who do I talk to? And they're more than happy to help out because they because mm-hmm. we behaved well um they feel good that we were buyers of the home and that we're taking care of a home they cared about and they're happy to answer questions and make things 
go smoothly for us because that's human nature is to want to help each other out. But people that come in with this, this distrust thing going on, I, I don't know what to say other than it is, it makes every single mm -hmm. aspect of the deal harder. And what, if you're a consumer listening to this, you really want to have a conversation with the agent you're thinking about hiring about how they handle negotiations. What's their approach. And if their approach doesn't involve a lot of talking on the phone, you probably are choosing yeah. the wrong agent um, because you have to talk to people often in person to create relationships that go smoothly. And it's a, it's a social capital. It's a reputational capital that's built up slowly over time where it's easily damaged by bad behavior. Um, and this is a small town. So agents that are based in Denver, uh, it's a much bigger city. And my experience personally has been those agents don't have as good bedside manner um, than agents in Boulder who do deals with each other small over and over feel. and over again. Like 80% of the deals are, yeah. it's an 80-20 rule. It's very close to that statistically in Boulder. And so we know every single top agent in town and we do our best to have good relationships with them. Um, and if you're a consumer, you should talk to the person you're considering hiring about how they manage those relationships in the conflict of interest zone when they're supposed to be representing their client, are they? And how do they manage that conflict of interest? Because we do have an interest in keeping good, healthy, positive relationships with our colleagues. And so we can go through several examples um, with you in person if you're thinking about hiring us about how we manage that. But it, it, it definitely has conflicts. And agents that don't acknowledge these conflicts either don't they just don't have the competence mm -hmm. or they're dishonest about it. It breeds distrust. Um, you know? okay. Yeah, it, yeah. Well, bad behavior be breeds distrust and distrust creates uh, massive amounts of problems in, in transactions and frequently deals that have a high degree of distrust don't close. So Introduces risk. <laughs> our yeah. job as, as one of the real estate attorneys who used to advise our uh, or industry here, Oliver used to say, he said, if you've got a willing buyer and a willing seller, get nice. out of the way. And he said that often agents will end up in legal trouble because they're doing things that actually make the transaction harder and not serving mm. their clients' needs at all. Uh, their egos get in the way. My ego certainly would have gotten in the way 20 years ago. And now when I feel like there's an egoic problem going on, I hit the pause button. I'm like, is this about me or is this about... Like what's in the best interest of my client? And that in fact happened this morning and I won't go into details about it where initially we were going to do one thing. And then I said, you know, hold up. I don't think that benefits our client. Let's, let's think about what does. And you had a call with the client that too. Because it's yeah. not about me. And, yeah. And had a call with the client to discuss this approach and make sure they're on board with what we're doing. So I can't go into any further details on that because it's a rather unusual deal. Um, and we'll see if it closes. So I think... I think that's it. I mean, I, I'm not sure what else there is to say, but I will tell you that in previous industries, when I worked in aircraft trading and I worked in the investment banking community, two things were really clear. People do business with those they like and people do business with those they trust and they pay a premium to do that. And the premium they're willing to pay to do that comes with experience and time. So if you're new in the industry, you do business with anybody, but as you've gotten older and more experienced, you recognize the value of high trust, high transparency transactions with people you competent. like that are respectful, but are also very professional and competent. And the premium is not insignificant. And it's not just measured in dollars, it's measured in misery or smoothness. And we see this over and over and over again in the real estate world, but it applies to other industries as well. Anywhere there's a high-end transaction, a high dollar transaction, you will find these principles in play and uh, yeah. choose your own adventure. It, this podcast felt like it screamed by. Yeah, <laughs> it has screamed by. It's gone very fast, uh, giving us only 45 minutes to wrap it up before we can run off to deal with other client needs. Uh, oh, yeah. We made things much more efficient, but typically hey, our we podcast made up for it. Last hour. podcast was like an hour and a half. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. So that, that, that makes up for it. Uh, we'll do a quick closing wrap. I'm Osman with House Einstein. If you're looking for real estate representation here in Boulder or in Denver or really anywhere on the front range and into the mountain towns, uh, we are now closing deals in Breckenridge and Frisco and um, we're moving towards Steamboat. We just did a Winter Park deal. 
I really enjoy mountain deals. So don't hesitate to reach out to us for mountain deals. You can find me at houseinstein.com. We also have agents that cover Denver and other local markets here in Colorado. So houseinstein.com is how to find us and reach us. Um, Thanks for listening last thoughts? and watching if you're on YouTube. All right. Thanks again. We'll catch you next time.